All right, I'd like to call the October 24th, 2022 regular meeting of the Shoreline City Council to order. Will you please join me in the flag salute? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Scully? Present. Deputy Mayor Robertson? Here. Councilmember Ramsdale? Councilmember Mark? Present. Councilmember McConnell? Councilmember Poby? Here. Councilmember Roberts? Here. And Councilmember McConnell and Ra Councilmembers McConnell and Ramsdell both indicated they were unable to be present tonight for personal reasons. Is there a motion related to those two? Deputy Mayor? I move that we excuse Councilmembers Mark and Ramsdell for personal reasons. Oh, McConnell. Did I say more? What did I say? Mork. Sorry. She's sitting next to you. Excuse me. Yeah. I move that we excuse council members McConnell and Ramsdell for personal reasons. Right. Is there a second? Second. Any opposition? All right. The motion passes unanimously. Next is approval of the agenda. Are there any requested changes to the agenda? Council member Roberts. Mayor, I move to add a new uh, item four, uh, which is adoption of a proclamation. Second. Any opposition to the motion to add the adoption of the proclamation as, as, as agenda item four? So after yeah. the report of the city manager? No, as in the agenda item four and then report of the city manager will be number five and so Understood. On. All right. All right. Is there any opposition to that motion? All right. Seeing none, the, that passes unanimously and I will read the proclamation at that point in the agenda. Any other requested changes to the agenda? Okay. Seeing none, the agenda as modified is adopted unanimously. Next up is uh, action item four, the report of the city manager, but it's gonna be preceded by a proclamation. I'm gonna read this one. Whereas Shoreline, Washington is a community which acknowledges that is the other one. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> Whereas Debbie Terry has worked for the city of Shoreline since 2000 and has served as city manager since 2014. And whereas Debbie was honored with the excellence award by the Washington City County Management Association in 2022, and whereas Debbie worked as the finance director for the city of Mill Creek, the administrative services director for Link Transit, and the accounting manager for the city of Wenatchee before coming to the city of Shoreline. And whereas Debbie served on the board of the Sound Cities Association and is president of the Washington Finance Officers Association for the Washington Cities Insurance Authority. And whereas Debbie provided stable leadership to the city, built a stronger community for Shoreline residents, and oversaw a number of significant accomplishments in the city of Shoreline, including Aurora Corridor improvements, light rail station area of planning, sidewalks and transportation infrastructure improvements, expanding the city's human services efforts and building an anti-racist community. And whereas Debbie is an inspiring mentor to the next generation of city managers and administrators. Now therefore I, Keith Scully, mayor of the city of Shoreline, on behalf of the Shoreline City Council, do hereby proclaim November 2nd, 2022 as Debbie Terry Day. <laughs> All right, and now that we've made you as uncomfortable as possible, do you have a, do you have a report for us? <laughs> Your mic's off. When you get a proclamation that says it's <laughs> Debbie Terry Day, she can't do anything right. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, thank you so much. That was uh, very kind. Um, so I'll start with my report and then I've got a few uh, the closing comments, if I could uh, indulge the council. So, all right. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say congratulations. Go to council member Evan Povey for earning a certificate of municipal leadership from the Association of Washington Cities, uh, AWC, Association of Washington Cities. Certificate of municipal leadership program recognizes city and town elected officials for accomplishing training in five core areas, roles, responsibilities, and legal requirements, public sector resource management, community planning and development, effective local leadership and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, Council Member Poby completed more than 30 hours of training to earn this distinction, so congratulations to him. And last Friday, the rains returned, and so it was time for Hamlin Halloween Haunt to take place. Um, and we had a great turnout regardless of the rainy and cold evening. There was um, over 700 people who chose to participate and the park was filled with Halloween shaped lights and decorations. People enjoyed hay rides, games, stories and songs around the campfire, a photo booth and hands on craft activities. Uh, thank you to all the community volunteers and staff who made this popular event possible. 
and Green Shoreline Partnership for Terra and the City of Shoreline are hosting Green Shoreline Day on Saturday, October 29th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. to help restore urban parks and shoreline. Volunteers are needed to plant trees, remove invasive weeds, and provide a helping hand to our green spaces. The event is open to uh, people of all ages. The volunteer events will be held at Brugger's Bog, Hamlin Park, North City Park, Paramount Open Space, and Richmond Beach Saltwater Park. And you can learn more and RSVP at greenshoreline.org. Um, greenshoreline uh, and join us for Indoor Playground Halloween on Monday, October 31st. It's the cutest show in town um, as children ages one to five arrive in costume to play games and participate in hands-on projects. And I can verify it is the cutest show in town. It's really fun uh, to see them. Um, $2 per child at the door for residents, $2.50 for non-residents. And for more information, visit shorelinewa.gov forward slash calendar or call 206-801-2600. And some public reminders, there is a Park Rec Recreation Cultural Service slash Tree Board. Um, they will hold a hybrid meeting on Thursday, October 27th at 7 p.m. And on the agenda is the Park Recreation Open Space Plan update and interviews. Uh, the Planning Commission will hold a hybrid meeting on Thursday, November 3rd at 7 p.m. in the Council Chambers and online via Zoom. And you can learn more about these meetings and other events at shorelinewa.gov forward slash calendar. And just a reminder that um, there is no council meeting on Monday the 31st, um, as that will be Halloween, and um, there's other things to dress up than council members um, there. So the next council meeting will be held on Monday, November 7th. Um, and um, as you all know, uh, tonight is my final council meeting. I, do, I don't know the exact number of council meetings I've attended over my career, but I think it's somewhere between 1,350 and 1,400 based on my scientific research. <laughs> so I'm gonna say this is my thir uh, 1,375th council meeting um, and it's appropriate that uh, budget's one of the last topics. Um, I sincerely wanna thank all of the city council members. It has been an honor to work with all of you over the many years and um, you know, I was sharing with somebody earlier tonight that I think one thing that really makes Shoreline a, a special is that uh, the people that choose to serve here are doing it because they have good intention. They wanna make Shoreline better. It's not based on an anti-agenda, uh, um, but it's really a commitment to the community and the work that is done through public service and the work that's done through the city. And so thank you to all of you for exemplifying that and continuing that tradition on. I know that great things will continue to happen at the city of Shoreline and um, I'll be able to say, I was there at one point but I know it's, it's just gonna be great. So I know Shoreline has a bright future and I look forward again to hearing about all the great things that happen and you all are um, a primary reason why that happens. It's your leadership. So thank you so much for having given me the um, privilege to serve as city manager. Um, just thanks. Okay. Thank you. Next up are council reports. So are there any council reports? Well, Councilmember Povey and I participated in a meeting this morning with uh, Representative Lauren Davis, along with uh, City Manager Terry, our police chief, and a few other folks, about the progress of radar and the crisis facility. Everyone is working on this project all at once, which is great, and we're going to do what we can to coordinate. We're first, so hopefully we'll be able to get our stuff up and running. And as I told the representative this morning, if we become superfluous in five years because there are so many services available, that's a win, and we can modify and adapt then, but we want to make sure that we get it stood up uh, as early as possible. Next up is public comment. Is there anyone signed up for public comments? No one has signed up for public comment. And there's no one remote either? Correct. Okay, thank you. Would anyone like to make public comment? Okay, we'll skip that portion. Moving on to the consent calendar, Deputy Mayor Robertson. I move approval of the consent calendar. Second that. Will the clerk please call the votes? Mayor Scully? Aye. Deputy Mayor Robertson? Aye. Councilmember Ramsdale, Councilmember Mork. Aye. Councilmember McConnell, Councilmember Poby. Aye. Councilmember Roberts. Aye. All right, the motion passes unanimously. Next up is action item 8A, which is action on resolution number 501. And because this will be our first time we take a vote on this specific one, we're gonna have a staff presentation followed by public comment and then uh, potential council action. And I believe Ms. Arcidi is doing the presentation remotely. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Tonight's presentation on the radar expansion 
We'll focus specifically on resolution number 501, which would authorize the city manager to sign the Regional Crisis Response Agency's Article of Incorporations and Interlocal Agreement. Uh, this is a follow-up to Council's September 26th discussion about the radar expansion, which also included an update on the crisis triage facility that evening as well. And here we go. All right. So as a reminder, this action supports Council's work to create a best practice framework for helping people in crisis. Tonight's action focuses on the quote-unquote someone to respond aspect uh, within this framework. On September 26th, Council discussed the creation of a nonprofit entity serving the five radar cities through an interlocal agreement to provide crisis response services. The city of Kirkland would act as the fiscal agent by hiring and loaning staff to the agency and providing ongoing fiduciary services as well. All five cities discussed this model in September and the staffing group reconvened to update the interlocal agreement based on feedback from our elected officials. There were a few changes that I'd like to bring to your attention tonight before you take action to authorize the city manager to sign the Articles of Incorporation and the ILA. The first change is a change to the name, which has been updated to become the Regional Crisis Response Agency and will be known as RACER. The previous name, Community Mobile Crisis Response Agency, didn't receive very positive feedback, but so far the name RACER has been quite favorable. Other changes include more language about the intent of the founding cities, which are known in the uh, Articles of Incorporation and the ILA as principles. These changes uh, include the intent to reduce reliance on police for crisis response, ensure that other service agencies also participate on the operations board, and to establish usage metrics that in addition to providing day-to-day -day management insights could also be used to assign agency voting and cost allocations. It also includes intent to have more frequent meetings with elected officials during the first two years of the agency's operations and to take time to establish the agency before adding new principles, whether they be cities or counties, to the agency. The ILA term is also reduced from four years to six years. The draft articles of incorporation were updated to include the new name, but no other changes were made to the articles of incorporation. So all five cities are currently reviewing and taking action on the ILA and articles of incorporation, and this should be completed by the middle of November. The agency's target start date is the first quarter of 2023, which will give Kirkland time to file the necessary paperwork with the state and complete other transition related work as well. The city's portion of the racer agency costs would be an average of 350,000 a year over the upcoming biennium. There are additional one-time startup costs of about 100,000 in 2023. Staff included this in the proposed 2023-2024 biennium budget, and staff is proposing the use of about 221,000 in annual cost savings from the school resource officer position to fund this. So tonight, staff is recommending that council approve resolution 501, which authorizes the city manager to execute the articles of incorporation and enter a local agreement with the Regional Crisis Response Agency. As Mayor Scully did share, while Council discussed this, uh, these documents previously, tonight um, is the first time that you'll see the language for resolution number 501. Per Council Rules of Procedure 6.1.B, Council must take public comment after the staff report and before Council reviews and takes potential action. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Arcee. I'd now I'd like to open the public hearing on this matter. Is anyone signed up for public comment? No one pre-registered. All right. And do, do I can't see this, the Zoom screen anymore. Do we have folks listening in? There are a number of attendees. All right. So, so I'd like to open it up for public comment. This is an opportunity for anyone to speak on this particular agenda item. We ask that you limit your comments to three minutes and you begin with your name and city of residence. If you would like to make a public comment, please raise your hand on Zoom or raise your hand in person if you're here. Let's give it just a minute. All right. 
Mayor Scully, no one has raised their hand. All right, thank you. I'll now close the public hearing. And because this is an action item, we usually begin with a motion. Or we can just sit here. <laughs> Mayor, sorry, if I move that. I move adoption of resolution number 501. Is there a second? Second. second. All right, motion and a second. Would you like to speak to your motion, Council? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I'm very excited that we're getting very close to getting this off the ground. Uh, October 2023 it still seems a long way away, but um, in terms of everything, it's going to be here before we know it. And so I'd like to thank the staff for putting this together. I'd like to thank the work that's been going on uh, across all five cities to get to this point. And I think that this is something that our community will definitely benefit from. And I'm very excited to see what kind of results the program is going to have and how and whether we need to expand this in the future. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Any other comments? All right, will the clerk please call the vote? Mayor Scully. Aye. Deputy Mayor Robertson. Aye. Council Member Ramsdale. <laughs> Council Member Mark. Aye. Council Member McConnell. Council Member Poby. Aye. Council Member Roberts. Aye. All right, the motion passes unanimously, and we're now on to study item 9A, which is the discussion of the 2023 2024 proposed biennial budget. And I believe Ms. Lane and, and Ms. Junke will be presenting. Council, we are pleased to be back. Oh, I always have this first slide challenge. There we go. <laughs> pleased to be back for our third discussion on the proposed budget. Tonight, we will be focusing on a re continued review of our department budgets with a focus on public works, our capital um, improvement plan, as well as some general fund transfer information. We will continue next week with um, two public hearings on November 7th. The first one focused on revenues and the second one on the general budget. And then continue with a third public hearing on the 14th with planned adoption on November 21st. So as always, the budget information is available online as well as um, for purchase on a CD at the city clerk's office. And again, tonight, um, we've got a packed agenda um, and public work. So um, Ms. Junkie and I will be doing this presentation and we will be um, joined by Nick Bohr, our Parks Fleet and Facilities Manager to share some information as well. So first we'll hop in. This will fall a little bit like we did last time where I will introduce um, the area and then turn it over to Ms. Junkie or to um, Mr. Bohr, and then um, council can ask questions after each fund that we talk about. So first, we're starting with public works, and um, you can see that their biennial budget is um, almost $15 million, and um, the staffing here is holding fairly constant. As we talked about, project staffing can be a little different. There's, this staffing number does not include staffing for utilities or the capital investment projects. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tricia to talk about what is included in their budget. Well, good evening. And as Sarah said, here's the start of our public works budget. You can see the breakdown of uh, the budget here, but what I really would like to point out is in that photo, you can see a photo of us doing pavement markings. This was a new program in 2021 uh, that has enabled us to bring this service in-house rather than utilizing King County or um, outside contractors. We were able to bring this in-house, getting more reliability um, and ability to do these uh, restriping. Uh, and in the long term, after, after some uh, initial investment in equipment, we will have a cost savings as well. And just to provide a little bit on public works, we have three divisions within public works. We have operations, 
and you can see the uh, different services provided within operations here, mainly focused on uh, assets and, and maintenance of the existing assets. Next slide. And then we also have engineering and transportation services with engineering focused on development review and capital project delivery and transportation services focused on long range planning, um, commute trip reduction and uh, coordination with regional transit and other regional partners. So as we move into the budget, we do have several one-time investments proposed in the 2023-2024 budget. First, we have several that are, are implementation steps based upon the transportation master plan that you all have been talking about several times over the past year. The first is concurren concurrency and transportation impact fees. Uh, this will allow us to take the new level of service uh, that has been discussed as part of the transportation element and the transportation master plan and allow us to operationalize that so that we can, con we can monitor uh, that level of service and ensure we're meeting the state standard for concurrency. Following that, we will also be re-looking at the projects and the rates for the transportation impact fees. We also have shared use mobility hubs which under these phase one and phase two, we will look at the ones in the transportation master plan, prioritize those uh, as those that we can do implement more quickly, and then look at, look at in phase two, the top five uh, priorities and build those out a little bit more, not into design, but more planning of what, what's available and what those would look like. The third item related to the transportation master plan is the high activity areas and porosity study. I know it's kind of a long word. Uh, this is looking in the light rail stations at the connectivity for pedestrians, vehicles, and uh, bicycles. Uh, we, these are some of the areas where we have long blocks or super blocks, and, and in order to create a more pedestrian-friendly neighborhood, we may need some additional connectors um, to be able to get some connections between blocks and allow that non-motorized activity to, to move throughout the area. And then street typologies, this takes us to, this takes us to um, improving our street matrix for, for developments where we identify uh, the, what a street should look like when it develops and this gives us more flexibility and helps define the, all the users uh, between bikes, peds, um, and, uh, and vehicles and, and parking and how we can best uh, allocate the space um, for developers or to make it easier for developers to know what to expect. And then last week you heard about the parking management uh, program and Public Works will have a supporting role in that, primarily for the RPZ and some of the parking studies that have been being done. And then finally we're replacing a downfleeted vehicle with an electric Ford F-150 Lightning pickup. Along with those one-time investments, we do have some ongoing investments related to maintenance for new and downfleeted vehicles. And do you have any questions? We'll stop with each section and ask if you have any questions related to public works. Council? Nothing for this section, thank you. Oh no, we do. You do, sorry. Councilmember Republic. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first of all, just want to appreciate uh, the way it's very thorough and straightforward. Um, the three uh, um, employees, the three new hires, are they already on board? The three new hires for development review? Yes. Um, one of them is on board. One of them we're in the process of hopefully getting an offer out, and the other one we have had a couple of hiccups at being able to advertise that position. So we're making progress. So you're making pro I appreciate that. And also just want to applaud you for the um, staffing changes and the distribution of you know, resources between uh, departments or divisions. What I, I'm actually curious about is the 71,500, which was for the replacement of the Ford F-150. Do you already have um, a replacement reserve fund for that? Or oh, this was totally, you know, fully funded? I will let Sarah answer that. Um, we do not have a replacement reserve for this vehicle. It was a downfleeted vehicle, meaning that when we were um, replacing a vehicle that did have replacement reserves, we determined we had a need and the vehicle that we were replacing was still serviceable, had serviceable life. And so at that time we decided to continue using it. It was before we had created, now when we do that, 
we determine whether it's a long-term need or a short-term need, and we would create the replacement fund. When we made the decision to downfleet that vehicle, we didn't have that policy in place, and so this is just a one-time contribution from the general fund in order to purchase that. Okay, but I assume the rest possibly do have, and they have the life cycle running. Yes, okay. yes, generally that is, and so it's only because it was a downfleeted vehicle, and I mean, there may be a, a time where we think initially that a vehicle will be a short-term down fleet, mm -hmm. and we might determine later that it really is a long-term need, um, but we find that that down fleeting is actually very cost effective. Thank you, ma'am. Any further questions? All right, thank you. Great, so we'll move on to our surface water utility. And in the surface water utility, you see that we have the um, biennial budget of about $28.5 million. And the staffing, again, is um, holding, holding steady at just under 17. And I will turn it over to Ms. Shunke again to speak about what the surface utility does. So the surface water utility has both operating expenditures and capital expenditures. Here you can see that the capital is roughly 56% of the total costs of the utility. Um, we also have just the general operating surface water management, but then also uh, some landscaping and then our maintenance activities uh, through our streets crews. The last transportation master plan had rate increases through 2023. For the 2023 through 2028 capital improvement plan, we have extended the rates that were set for 2022 and 2023 of 5% and extended those out through 2028. This gives us a, a single family home rate of $328.91 in uh, 2023. This is certainly council's choice of what the rate increase will be, uh, but we use this 5% for consistency and then the rate will be reevaluated with the transportation master plan that uh, is updated is beginning here shortly. We do have one one-time expenditure here for business inspection uh, source control program. This was anticipated within the last uh, surface water master plan. This program uh, has us working with business owners to um, look at how they're storing materials and how they can do businesses differently to not degrade our water quality. And then moving into the capital projects, here's our seven capacity projects. The projects throughout this presentation that are highlighted in yellow means that those are new projects within the 2023 through 2028 CIP, and they were not in the last CIP. And we also have nine projects related to the repair and replacement projects. And here you can see we have three new projects um, and several of these are already under construction. Next slide. And then finally, we have a few other projects. The surface water master plan, as I mentioned, will, the update will be beginning soon. Um, and then the strategic opportunities project is a new program to set aside money so that we have opportunities related to other capital projects or related to development to improve surface water systems. Okay. Any questions on the surface water utility? Sorry, Councilman Roberts. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> just want to be clear. So our current plan for surface water includes the 5% rate increases for 2023 and 2024. It's hard thinking about budgets in <laughs> 2024 already. Um, and we recognize that um, I mean, that's less than the current rate of inflation at this moment. But you said that we're going to be reevaluating the rates and um, in this next few months or next year or so. Um, uh, that's correct. Correct. And, just, <laughs> and then when we last did this, I mean, there was a, we recognized that there was a lot of sort of catch up work that we needed to do in the. Do we have a sense, I mean, again, you don't have to answer this now if, we don't, if you don't have this information, but do we have a sense of, I mean, are we, did we make good progress in catching up with some of those projects that we identified and the needs within the, within the surface water utility that we identified? Um, because I would think at some point, I mean, we'd sort of get to more of a maintenance 
level of. Yeah, let me get back to you. Put of that course. on the matrix, and we'll get a better response for that. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Other questions? Thank you. Great. Moving on to our wastewater utility. We see that the wastewater utility, now fully assumed by the city of Shoreline, has a um, biennial budget of 50, just over $54 million, and um, staffing at 20 and a half, again, staying fairly constant through the biennium. And with that, I will turn it over. Here you can again have, see a similar uh, breakdown between capital and operations. Uh, but here, the wastewater capital it only accounts for about 29% of the overall cost for the utility. And we do have one one-time uh, ad for this utility, and this is a wastewater condition assessment program that will allow us to take the pipe inspections that we ha information we have and come up with a consistent and systematic way to evaluate the pipes in setting our priorities uh, and life cycle costs related to uh, how we make decisions on which pipes to repair or replace. And then our ongoing um, budget changes uh, is implementation of the expanded low income rate program as you discussed in the rate study. Uh, a 0.25 FTE accountant that this is, this is really moving a position from a 0.75 to a 1.0, but it's offset by professional service reductions. And then there's a half time uh, CIP project planning, but this is a shared shared position that's project supported and doesn't end up with an additional FTE. Now moving on to the capital, this is the first six year CIP we have created as a city since we have completed assumptions. Thus all the projects are listed as new projects. We have six new projects related to capacity, all focused on lift stations. And then we have 13 projects related to pipe repair and replacement. And finally, we have a few other projects. Uh, the most notable is Linden Maintenance Facility, some upgrades and some improvements um, to the, the current maintenance facility. And I will talk a little bit about the rate study. Um, council has discussed this on several times, a city engaged FCS group to perform a comprehensive rate study for the wastewater utility. And we started that back in January. and and have had three conversations with council has provided guidance on policies. All of those have been incorporated into um, the city's budget at this point. The budget was based from an operating perspective on um, the actual expenses from 2021 and our projected year end expenses for 2022. And then the capital was based upon all the projects that you just heard about that came from the um, wastewater master plan adopted by um, Ronald Wastewater District before Assumption. So the outcome of that, as we, I think, discussed last in August, is a $4.10 per month increase, um, which will be required every year in 2023 through 2026 with a $2.25 per month increase required in 2027 to 2028. The chart that you see there does show what our total rate, this includes the um, wastewater treatment pass-through costs against all of our, or many of our neighboring cities. And you can see that the city of Shoreline, even with this adjusted rate for 2023, is still below the median of those cities. And that is looking at their 2022 rates. So I'm confident that once with any increases, they might be considering that we'll be under the median. Oh, so before we move on, any questions around wastewater? Questions on wastewater? How's everyone? Yeah. Uh, the total amount asked is quite a bit higher in this final budget than as compared to before. Can you explain what that's from, what the main drivers are? The primary driver in the increase is the in lar much larger capital program than we had in the last biennial budget. So through that master plan that was updated, I think there was a lot of long-term projects that were identified that needed to be invested in in order for the um, wastewater utility to continue to function.
Councilmember Poby. All right, thank you. And so this is still an enterprise fund as we looked at the other day, right? Exactly, it is an enterprise fund, just like the surface water utility fund. Yeah, so I'm just thinking, how are the policies of this uh, being aligned with what we have in terms of, especially with regards to um, reserves? The, the policies are very similar um, to the surface water policy as an enterprise um, fund. So, and I can, I can put a, um, a question in the matrix that gets a little bit more into detail on what those policies are, if that would be helpful. Okay. The last is I'm thinking of the new six projects, which, which is great. And um, I was about to ask the same question that Councilmember Mark did ask. When it used to be very independent, you had full hands, people solely responsible for it. And so I'm just curious if we are using the same approach, which is the TCO, that is total cost of ownership. Are we able to build, operate, and sustain it or maintain it? How are we using that? This is a policy question, though, but I'm just wondering, how are we taking that approach? And I think that was part of the intent of doing that very comprehensive rate study, was looking at the full plan, the, the capital plan, as well as our operating costs, and and really thinking about, and that's where council provided guidance on looking at a very balanced use of debt funding, along with using our pay-as-you-go, using some of our reserves that we already have, and balancing that, looking at the long term, so that we wouldn't have huge spikes in rates mm -hmm. and um, keep them consistent. So it is taking a very long-term approach as we look at that. Thank you. Councilmember Roberts. Uh, thank you, Mayor. When we, in what you know about some of our um, surrounding jurisdictions, I mean, do you have a sense of what kind of rate hikes they're considering? I have to admit that I have not reached out to ask those questions. Uh, that's fine. I just wonder if you it, happen to know or I, anything up I, I don't, <laughs> but if, if you'd like, I can put it in the matrix and see if we could get the answer. Um, um, I, I guess, I, no, I don't want it to this, but okay. I mean, is, is it your sense that other cities are contemplating similar I, or? Yes, I, I don't know about other wastewater utilities, but I know when I, I spoke with um, North City Water, I know they were anticipating, you know, probably in the 5% range. I just think given the economic pressures everybody's feeling that it would be unlikely that a, um, that a utility wouldn't have to do a rate increase. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Any further comments? All right. Thank you. So now we'll move on to our 2023 to 2028 proposed capital improvement plan. And um, I think Ms. Shunke is going to take the, take the lead on this. And we'll be inviting um, Mr. Boer to join us. So we've already heard from the surface water and the wastewater capital, so this leaves us with three capital improvement programs, our general capital, our city facilities and major maintenance, and our roads capital fund. And with that, I think that um, this shows the breakdown with the primary uh, uh, or the higher percentage being focused on transportation. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Bohr for discussion on the general capital fund. Good evening, Dick. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot one more, <laughs> my bad. Um, we do have one key element to this uh, CIP that is uh, unique and new, is we do have a one-time investment for some project management software. This will replace our currently uh, Excel spreadsheet and help us better track and manage our uh, capital budgets. Um, and to go with that, we do have a 0.5 FTE uh, IT functional analyst that will help support that project management software. And we have also added a 0.5 FTE urban forester that you'll hear more about here in a second. And with that, I'll hand it over to Nick. Good evening. Thanks for having me. Um, to start off, so the general capital fund includes funding for both parks and facilities projects. Um, King County Parks Levy funds support all the parks ecological restoration projects. These include ecological projects, um, include the city's green Cities program, trail maintenance and restoration with Earth Corps, uh, update of our urban forest strategic plan, et cetera, and so on. These projects support the city's environmental efforts, including 
the Tree City USA and salmon safe certification requirements. Parks repair and replacement funds support repairs and replacements of items such as resurfacing of sport courts and parking lots, play areas, as well as repairs of other park infrastructure and amenities. The playground replacement project supports larger scale replacements of aging play areas. Currently, no play areas are scheduled for replacement in this biennium. And then the turf and lighting repair and replacement program is scheduled to replace the lighting at Shoreline Park Fields A and B in 2023. This, this will contribute to the aging infrastructure and reduce light pollution and realize some energy cost savings. Facilities projects. So work continues on phase one of the city's maintenance facility project with construction of the Ballinger facilities scheduled for completion in 2023-24 biennium. The city was able to renovate four restrooms in 21-22 using Washington Department of Commerce grant funds and we are seeking additional state grant funding to refurbish four additional restrooms in 23-24. Parks development projects. So the general capital fund continues to implement the $38.5 million Parks bond project which was approved by voters earlier this year. The city has selected Forma Methune as a progressive design build team consultant with initial kickoff meeting in July of 2022. Surveys including geotech, critical areas, arborists, and cultural resources um, assessments are underway for all eight project sites and they should be completed by the end of November. The team is, excuse me, finalizing public engagement plan and has participated in several events, including Celebrate Shoreline and the Ballinger Friendship Festival. They will soon be updating the city's website and in in installing new signs at each park. A 30% design milestone should also be completed in November, at which time a focused public outreach is planned to begin. Permitting, permit applications will begin to be submitted in the first quarter of 2023 and we anticipate breaking down on several improvements during the summer of 2023. The bond project also includes funding that will support acquisition of future park land, as well as design of existing undeveloped parks, including Edwin Pratt, Westminster, Rotary, and 92nd and Aurora. Funding for public art is also included, which will be guided by our public art plan. Council has designated 3.4 million general fund contribution to address inflationary cost increases since initial conceptual design. This general fund contribution is programmed in the CIP and staff are working diligently to mean, minimize the amount of general fund contributions needed in this project. Any questions? Council Member Public. Yeah. Uh, just one, thank you. I'm, I'm just curious, um, on page 343, I'm, what will be happening in 2025, especially for the City Hall garage long-term maintenance? I am not. Oh. oh. So I saw, yeah, I'm sorry. City facility major maintenance. Yeah, so we'll cover that and then we can answer your question. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay, so moving on. Uh, facilities major maintenance, real quick uh, report. Facilities major maintenance funded through general capital, general fund contributions to maintain existing city facilities and build a reserve for significant future costs. Um, Given the recent significant cost increase, the contributions for 2023 was increased by 10.14%, the CPI, as opposed to the original 3%. Council Member Poby, you were asking about what was gonna be happening in 2024? Excuse me, yeah, especially with the um, City Hall garage maintenance, because the projections seem to be very steady until it gets to 2025, then it jumps about three times. I'm sorry, five times. Yeah, totally understand. Um, so we really need to protect the water integrity of the surface, and we're looking at having to redo the, the coating on top so to make sure okay, water doesn't get in. And 
undermine the tension cables that are in there. So it's a bigger cost there. Okay. Further questions? Great. I'll turn it back to Ms. Shungi to talk about Rhodes Capital. And we need to get a third microphone for that table. I apologize. You have to scramble around like that. <laughs> Rhodes Capital is our last capital program. Here you can see we have 16 pedestrian and non-motorized projects. Uh, worth noting is that all of the new sidewalk programs are now programmed out within the CIP and scheduled to be completed by 2028. We also have a priority in here for the 147th, 148th non-motorized bridge. Uh, phase one construction of that project will begin in 2023. Next slide. And then we have our safety and operation projects. Uh, worth noting is our 145th corridor and our 145th and I-5 interchange projects have met a 90% uh, design milestone and are scheduled to go to construction next spring or go to add next spring. Um, it is worth noting that uh, we, with updated estimates, we are anticipating potentially a funding gap on the, on the interchange project. Our team consider, continues to look at ways to save costs and also look at additional revenue sources. Next slide. And then finally, we have our uh, annual programs, our system preservation, and then also the transportation master plan that'll be wrapped up here in 2023. Any, I think that's my last slide. N any questions? Questions from Council? Councilman Roberts. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. Uh, one question I have is we know that where inflation is sort of broadly, but do you, what is the sense of where inflation is for um, sidewalks, asphalt, um, those kind of road construction, that kind of raw material? I will add that one to the matrix and get back to you. I'll tell you when I looked at this about six months ago, it was averaging over 10%. And I've seen, I've seen it was more 10 to 15%. But let me double check current numbers. Oh, I, mean, I think that is. Does that get you close that enough? That gets close enough. I mean, and how, with the sidewalk program specifically, do we have a sense that we currently, we'd, there was enough in that bond to make it through this kind of inflationary? I don't think we've looked at that at this time. Okay. Because it also would then take looking at what how we're how well we're doing with collecting our sales and use tax. But we'll be happy to add that and get you a better answer. Yeah, I would be curious to know to make sure that um, the projects that we say we're going to be able to to complete well, can be completed. Well, can still be completed within this uh, environment. Okay. I know that the alternative is to to get this done is to use gener more additional general fund money to transfer to roads. And I mean, that's something that we can, councils can do, but I think it's, we know that our community wants and expects great public services and our whole financial strategy was designed so we did not have to sp transfer as much to public works as we had in the past. And I, mean, uh, this, I think this council and the staff have done a great job of keeping that to a minimum, but uh, there are times where we know that we ha we're going to have to make choices between um, general fund services and supporting the maintenance that we need to make sure that we don't have we don't pay, have to pay continue to pay more to sort of rebuild projects when we can just maintain our existing infrastructure. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. Other comments or questions, Councilor Moore. Uh, Mayor, I have a question on the capital project criteria. Is this the right time to ask that? Is Lane? I mean, yes, I think. Oh, okay. Uh, on page 289, there is a list of the criteria used, and I didn't see any mention of any climate action plan related items or sustainability or anything like that in the criteria. And I was wondering, is it included in a different category or? How is this, how does this work? I recognize it's not included. We probably have not updated this list to include the climate action plan at this time. That is a very good catch. But I would say it is definitely something that is considered in, in every evaluation. Thank you. Other questions or comments? 
I had a couple. Um, you mentioned a potential shortfall on the interchange project. I assume that's 145th. The, the, obviously, my, my concern rose tremendously with that because that is a giant project, and the timing of it's pretty critical. Where are we at on that, and what, how much of a shortfall is, is, a, is probable? So we're at still at a point where we have some risks and we're still trying to evaluate those risks. Um, we have a lot of unknowns relative to utility reimbursement and right-of-way acquisition. So I'll caveat that, that we, you know, we still have these unknowns. So when I have calculated this, we're anywhere between a $1 million and a $7 million shortfall. And, and have we identified potential other funding sources? I, I know we have a lot of different funding sources there. Are some of those able to be increased to compensate for the fact that it's just a different world than when we first put this out? Yeah, we've just identified this within the last couple of weeks, so we're just starting to turn those rocks over what other funding sources there might be. But again, our focus is on how do we get our, our utility partners to pick up more of the costs related to their utility relocations, okay. and how do we minimize some of our construction costs by some value engineering. Okay. I would encourage you to keep us posted on that. Not, it doesn't have to be formal presentations, but that, that's potentially a big delta, and that's, if not our biggest project, one of our biggest projects, and I would hate to see it get on up. Right, exactly. Thank you. Um, I also had a question. Uh, you mentioned the urban forester. That, that's fantastic. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about what that position entails? Yeah, so um, we, we see the need. We were able to get funding and this, a new position, so we used some of the urban forestry money, and also we're using, uh, we're converting temp money to make a whole position, permanent position. We anticipate then having an F, half an FTE really focus on urban forestry uh, with the, the projects, uh, help managing the, the volunteer projects, uh, looking at um, inventory, trying to complete the inventory. So uh, just a focus on that. It's, it's, it's on everybody's mind. It's very important to everybody, F including focused, us. I apologize. Focused on public lands or also on private projects? Focusing on public lands. Uh, that's fantastic. I think it's a need. I would encourage us to think about yeah. expanding that. We have a tree code which, you know, gets mixed reviews, um, and I, I would love to know more about how it's actually working in the field. We tend to get anecdotes. Thank um, you. It would be fantastic to have somebody who is keeping Sounds an eye on good. that. And finally, I had a comment that actually belonged several categories ago. For some reason, I thought it was in CIP. But the shared use mobility hubs are in there. We discussed it in depth at a preceding budget meeting. And my understanding, I just want to repeat it, is that that is some specific funding to look at that and that we're not diverting funds from building more sidewalks or bike lanes or whatever else to fund that project. Correct. Okay. And I would just add that that's not because I think it's a bad idea. It's just that we have some basic stuff here, infrastructure stuff, that I would hate to see us come up with some shiny new thing when we have some sidewalks that still go nowhere. Correct. This does not include any funding for design of any of these shared mobility hubs. All right, thank you. Any other questions or comments from council? Thank you. Great, now we'll move on to the very exciting um, general fund transfers and fund balance section. So. It has the word fun in it. It does, it does. I, I find this very exciting. Um, so the next three slides detail um, the various items that we are transferring money out of our general fund um, and um, where they are going. So you'd see that there's transfers for the um, city maintenance facility we just talked about, as well as the Shoreline A and B field replacement and the Parks Bond project. So those are all, you know, the two one-time contributions as well as planned transfers. Um, we also have the major maintenance contribution happening. And then on Rhodes Capital, there are um, three different contributions, including, you know, half a million for the 147-148 um, non-motorized bridge um, and Richmond Beach driveway um, relo relocation. And then we have um, transfers into our debt service funds, the street fund, and um, just some others, including unemployment fund transfer that happens every year. Um, and finally, the um, ending fund balance slide. So this shows you um, where our, where we intend to, where we have ended the year and where we expect to end the year, 22, 23, and 24. So what you're seeing here is the green slice is our revenue stabilization fund. So um, 
we might think of that as the rainy day fund. If we have a significant decrease in, um, in ongoing revenues, that's the fund we'd tap into. The red section is what we're considered designated. So these are items where council has indicated we're planning to use that general fund reserves for that. It's our, our dedicated savings account. We just haven't transferred it yet. And then the blue is the undesignated um, reserves. So at the end of this biennium, we do anticipate that that undesignated um, reserve would be at just over $10 million. So then, any questions about the exciting general fund transfers or ending fund balance? Okay, then I'll move on to debt service payments and other funds. So this, um, this slide has a lot of words on it, but it summarizes all of our debt service funds, what those funds um, are supporting and where the payment repayment comes from. The ones I'll focus on are the um, new ones. So we have the um, VLF revenue bonds that um, were issued in this biennium and um, are, so are fairly new. So that is supported by the $20 um, vehicle license fee and supports our annual road surface maintenance as well as the sidewalk rehabilitation program. Then we have the brand new 2022 bond anticipation notes that will be supported by an excess levy, property tax levy approved by voters in February. And then the um, what was the 2020 and is now the 2022 bond anticipation. I might have just said that wrong. So the second one I talked to was our Unlimited tax, that's the excess levy. And then the um, and then we have our bond anticipation notes that now um, just support the property that is a future um, potential community and aquatic center. And it is fully supported by revenue from the business that sits on that property. And then this is a summary of our other funds and the various expenditures that um, that you see from those funds. So including um, the transportation impact fees fund. And I will note, you might wonder why parks impact fee has a zero appropriation. And that is because at this point, council hasn't designated any, any expenditures for the biennium for that. And that normally comes as the um, property acquisitions are identified. And then council approves that appropriation through an amendment. So, just a, any questions on debt service or other funds? Okay, we'll wrap up with a quick review of the schedule. Again, we're coming back on November 7th, um, and that will be two public hearings I talked about earlier. We also are asking that council submits their amendments, any amendments you might have to staff by end of day on November 9th. And that way we will have issued the staff report for November 14th, but we'll be able to share those with council before that meeting and discuss them on our meeting at November 14th, which will help the adoption discussion on November 21st. Um, so, any other general questions or comments? Quest questions or comments, please, Councilmember. Member. It's just a general question, thank you. It's a lot of, um, information to digest. How has the upper fund influenced our financial policies and procedures as far as this budget cycle is concerned? I'm sorry, I missed the very first part. How has the... Upper, ARPA ARPA. fund. Oh, yeah. thank you, sorry. Um, I would say that the ARPA hasn't significantly influenced the development of, of this budget because we've already received all of the funds for ARPA. We actually have, um, have went through the audit. We were able to use those to fund police services, which then freed up funds that we're now supporting as council has directed. So you are seeing some appropriation of funds in the budget, but it's, um, you'll probably even see more amendments because I think some of that work will just continue and as, as the staff have identified the specific work, then they'll bring back actual further amendments for those. So there, is, there are some ARPA supported amendments in here, but not a significant number. 
you. Thank you, Mayor. Councilman Roberts. To follow along with Councilmember Poby's uh, question, what you're suggesting is that some of the federal monies that the shoreline have received have influenced what the surpluses on the budget are. Is that a fair that, statement? That is true. There is still balance in that red um, part of the, let's go back to this, part of the funds that are in that, that red section that we consider designated are some of those funds that council has set aside to be used for very specific purposes related to ARPA. And, and some of those funds, as you explained to Councilmember Poby, I mean, sort of help relieve pressure on other budgets. And so. Exactly. Um, so you can't just sort of look at this and without recognition of the support and investment from the federal government to directly to the city of Shoreline. Correct. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Um, can you remind us, I know we've discussed this, election day is November 8th, and we have the levy lid lift on the ballot. We won't know until November 8th at the earliest whether that's going to pass. And when on the 7th we've got 2023-2024 revenue sources. What's the plan for that? Well, I've been actually working on that staff report for you, and so in there um, we're focusing on what's been presented to council within this budget, which is the without a successful levy lift, yeah. but I am providing the information about what the um, what the property tax assessment would be with the levy lid lift and what the potential rate impacts and options are. So you will see that we'll have two potential um, um, ordinances, thank you, that I, I couldn't think of that word for a minute, that will be um, being discussed so that then when it comes time to adopt, um, the one, the way I understand from our city attorney is that they'll be written in a way that if the voters approve it, one is effective, and if the voters don't approve it, the other one is effective. So we'll be we'll be discussing two different ordinances. Right, and this is, this is an agenda management thing that we can handle offline, but, but, but remind me why we're doing it that way, why, why we aren't waiting a week. Um, I think that, I mean, we could wait till November 14th, but I think we'd published, I, and. It, it's, so, it, all right, okay, Let's, yeah. we, we can discuss this offline, and I apologize for that, it, it just occurred yeah. to me, I, I was looking at Google and confirming that, you know, we're the day before. Councilmember Roberts, do you have a comment? Yeah, Mayor, I think that uh, the requirement is that there has to be two public hearings on for the budget and the way the schedule is set up so you don't, so I mean, we we have, I believe we have until the end of the, the year to actually adopt the budget, but traditionally we have always tried to adopt the budget in November. Um, well, actually we, I think we have to adopt it by the first um, Monday in December, so we don't have that much longer after what we that's, normally do. That, that's and, right, and the Thanksgiving holidays yeah. in there. And, and we have to file the, the levy by the 30th, and so backing into it. Um, that's, that, that's right, yeah. yeah. All right, Th thank, thank you. It's, that, it's just the stars align that way, this project. Yes. Yeah, and okay. I, th I think that uh, we have traditionally not had the public hearing in the same night as budget adoption for sort of just... Transparency. Yeah, transparency, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Thank Th you, Thank you. Anything else okay. from council? All right, thank you, Ms. Lane. Great, thank you. All right, our final agenda item tonight is study item uh, 9B, um, which is discussion of the 2024 pros, 2024 pros plan and uh, approach to outreach and engagement. I believe Ms. Kelly will be doing it remotely. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Colleen Kelly, Director of Recreation, Cultural, and Community Services. And I'm here tonight with our um, inaugural discussion of the upcoming uh, update of the city's parks, recreation, and over, uh, open space plan. I'll provide a short overview of our planning process in general. And then Frana Milan from Jefferson Associates is here to uh, give a little bit of a deeper dive about our overall engagement plan. So by way of some background, um, council's familiar with the um, general pros planning requirement that uh, we do have uh, an update every six years. So the current plan that we have adopted is effective through 2023. 
Uh, we are required to have a new plan in place in time for 2024. So the timeline that uh, Frana will share later will show you how we're planning to have that document to you uh, by the fall of next year so that we are in compliance with that timeline. Uh, staff uh, had a general uh, review of the current pros plan format and in general feels like the, the overall approach of the current plan is a helpful one in terms of using the strategic and action, action initiatives to categorize work and focus some particular action strategies under those areas of work. So in general, we intend to use that same format. Um, our early discussions with the Park Recreation and Cultural Services Tree Board um, elicited a lot of interest in um, a concept that's very much in alignment with our anti-racism resolution, which is to really look at opportunities to um, focus on a broader outreach effort, making sure we reach uh, parts of our community that typically maybe go unheard and maybe underserved. Um, and so that's kind of where our engagement strategy conversation has started. So with that, um, the timing was such that the planning staff were also beginning their uh, discussions and thinking about their comprehensive plan update and uh, reached out to community services around ideas for how to reach a broader community of um, uh, folks who could provide input on that planning process. So uh, that got us thinking about working together in a, a really intentional way and in a way that hopefully won't kind of fatigue our community around being asked for one-off input related to planning processes that are uh, in some cases, especially with the comprehensive plan, complex and kind of uh, dense with city business, city, city stuff. So um, we hit upon the idea of carving out uh, from the overall uh, consulting work uh, looking for a consultant that had specific expertise in equitable community engagement that could work with us on both of these planning processes. Um, the pros plan timing is uh, in front of the comprehensive plan timing. So the front load work that we are currently doing with Stefferson and Associates, the consulting team that we have hired, uh, is really focused on uh, starting to get um, some connections built with our community that we will use for input related to the pros plan with a full intent to also use those same connections then as we uh, transition into the planning work related to the comprehensive plan. Uh, at the same time, of course, we have the uh, design build consultants that are working on the de uh, delivery of the park bond bundle, bundle, park bond bundle, I think is how they're referring to that now. Um, and there are opportunities, some opportunities for input related to that. Uh, and so we are trying to leverage the work that we are doing uh, with Jefferson Association uh, Associates to incorporate opportunities to ask more specific and pointed questions related to those particular uh, park development projects where those opportunities arise. So again, trying to leverage our contacts with the community as much as possible while, while really focusing on reaching a broader swath of our community in general. Um, so let's see, let me go ahead to the next slide. I guess that was all I wanted to share with you. Uh, so with that, I will introduce Frana Milan, who is the uh, one of the representatives of Stefferson and Associates. She's our primary project manager, uh, and she will talk you through uh, the specifics of the equitable engagement strategy that we are working on with them. Great, thank you, Colleen. And thank you everyone for, for having, uh, having me this evening at, at your meeting. Um, as Colleen said, I'm the project manager for this effort. Uh, my name is Frana, I use she, her pronouns. And um, first let me tell you a little bit about us at um, Stefferson and Associates. So we are a small minority owned consulting firm and we specialize in public involvement and communications for planning and design and construction projects. 
And, you know, we've worked with state and regional and local agencies in the central Puget Sound region, mostly, and we engage on public works and infrastructure type projects, including more than 50 citywide planning projects and six pros plans. Uh, we've also worked in Shoreline in the past, um, most recently on the North 148th Street uh, Bridge project, as well as the 145th corridor improvement projects. Um, you know, we've done, well, we're currently doing uh, outreach for the Seattle Transportation Plan, and here are some examples on there of some other plans that we have done in the past. And really, our, our ethos is putting into practice um, our, our values and beliefs around stakeholder and public engagement, that it not only builds understanding of how government works among uh, among the residents, but it also lays the, the foundation for governments to make smart and thoughtful and more equitable decisions. So here's a timeline for the um, PROS plan, as Colleen had mentioned, and let's see, navigating here. So as you can see down at the bottom, um, around the fourth quarter in 2023 is the anticipated time to um, transmit that from uh, to you all for your consideration. And then moving on to the first quarter of 2024 is when that is due. Uh, the plan is due, as Colleen mentioned, every six years uh, to be updated. And it's due to the Washington Recreation and Conservation Office so that Shoreline can maintain eligibility for certain state and federal grants. So those are some drivers of the timeline. Um, and then just to highlight uh, the next couple of months will be when we'll be conducting the bulk of the community engagement activities. So um, I will go more into those details in just a moment. Um, but as you can see here, also the technical analysis will be getting uh, getting ready as well, getting started here um, very shortly as the technical consultant is onboarded. So first I'd like to start actually at the end. <laughs> And think about what will be different when we conclude this process for, for the PROS plan first, and then ultimately down the road with the comprehensive plan. And this is the vision of what we believe will result from these efforts. So in the future, we see that a robust PROS plan will result from these efforts uh, reflecting a broader representation of the shoreline community that there will be more residents aware and engaged and using their local parks, and that there'll be a solid base of community relationships to build on moving forward into the comprehensive plan update process. And a little bit about the goals. So we really see these goals as our North Star. So it comes down to relationships and building trust between the city government and the residents of Shoreline, um, listening and moving together, both as the city government and the residents, and building awareness and understanding. So I'll, I'll discuss a little bit in more details our engagement strategy, but want to mention that it will be both broad and deep. So on one level, we will collaborate with staff um, on engagement tools and tactics that are really good for, for reaching a broad uh, range of people. Um, you know, things that have been tried and true and successful in Shoreline in the past. But then on another level, we'll do a deep dive with a subset, um, very intentionally, of a subset of audiences to listen and learn and really learn from audiences that historically haven't been at the table for government decision making processes. And so, you know, Colleen mentioned that this is an uh, equitable engagement process. And so I wanted to take a minute first to just review about what, what we mean when we say that. So for us, it's really 
that it's um, it means that we are both looking, we're looking at, at the pros plan and the comprehensive planning processes holistically and thinking about how we can support the city to build relationships in the long term. So as Colleen mentioned, not just a one stop, you know, we're coming to ask you something that we need from you right now, you know, which is uh, just habitually, you know, something that happens with, with government agencies um, of all sorts. And so it's trying to change that, that perspective or that transactional nature to build more authentic relationships with, with residents. And so I see that happening in, in kind of these two different buckets. So one is understanding and overcoming barriers to participation in civic processes. And the other is just centering equity at every step. And, you know, I see this work as being consistent with the city's goals towards building an anti-racist community. And this means that we'll focus intentionally on engaging a, a subset of audiences. So it will be a diverse set of individuals or community-based organizations that identify as part of a community um, that really hasn't been at the table before in city planning processes. And so we've identified these audiences as uh, those that may include residents, um, for example, immigrants or refugees who speak English as a second language or residents or business owners who identify as BIPOC, residents living with low incomes or organizations that, that serve that constituency, um, as well as people who identify as having a disability and youth. And I'm sure there will be others, um, but this is our, our starting point for our deep dive. And part of this effort is really aligning the right tool with the right audience. And so this is uh, the bullet points summarize the activities that will anchor our work. And you know, I do like to say that this will evolve, this work will evolve as we go because we'll be learning from Shoreline community members at each touch point. And so it will be an iterative process based on the things that we learn in, in kind of step one will help inform step two, which will help us improve step three and so forth. So more specifically, here are some of the ways that we will practice the equitable approach to engagement. So what this means uh, more specifically is that we'll focus on language access, for example. So we are working with a, a language access firm that will uh, partner with us to provide translation and trans creation and interpretation, as well as advising us on ways that uh, we can reduce potential language barriers in all of our activities, whether it's printed materials or ways that we are, are approaching focus groups or, or small group conversations. We'll look at compensation. And, and by that, I mean um, a strategy that shows that the city is, is interested in um, honoring people's time and their community knowledge. And that can take a range of, of ways. Um, you know, it could be everything from um, an hourly honorarium to transportation passes or offering childcare at public events. And, you know, these are all things that help reduce barriers to, to being involved in civic processes. We'll also have multiple touch points. So varying ways to, to engage, whether that's online or in person in different languages or varying times and, and places for, um, for participation. And then shared outreach. And what I mean by that is together with the city, we'll develop a deeper level of involvement uh, with organizations and individuals. Um, you know, in this way, we'll be able to identify and co-create and implement outreach opportunities that are relevant in their respective communities. So as I outlined earlier, there were some key milestones that uh, the city is trying to meet with the PROS plan. Um, and here's just kind of a, a look ahead at what is on the horizon in the next several months. So we're designing our engagement strategy to fit within the, that time frame. 
which means coming up in the next month, we will be doing um, constituent interviews. So that's more, what I mean by that is more like one-on-one -on -one, um, interviews um, that will be a little bit more in-depth and informative. So it's a really great opportunity for relationship building and learning. Uh, we'll have a virtual open house and survey, and that will really anchor our broader participation effort. And that will also be translated into um, four languages. Um, later on, after the, uh, after the technical um, consulting team is on board and has done some of their initial analysis, we will um, continue with small group conversations. And you know, by that, we're thinking that we would like to work with um, individuals and community-based organizations to carry out just, they could be informal living room conversations. They could be you know, meetings uh, in the library or online as well. Um, and those could be in different languages as well as um, giving more of a, a broad, uh, giving more of a, a group um, interview and a, off, uh, opportunity for, for feedback in that setting. And then having a public uh, information session about the, the pros plan. So that concludes my presentation. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to be here. And um, yeah, I think Colleen and I are available if you have any questions. Questions or comments from council? Councilmember Pauly. Thank you, appreciate the uh, presentation. I also appreciate the different tools that you have available as part of the project. What I was looking forward to was to possibly cite an example which will serve as a, uh, as a selling proposition. And so without you saying that, I would like to ask, how has your firm utilized community feedback to affect, uh, to change or to make um, critical changes to some of your designs and implementations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, what our role is, has been is really helping uh, our public agencies. So, you know, whether I think the one of the examples that comes to mind for me right away is with the uh, with sound, one of our projects with Sound Transit, where they were exploring um, their fair enforcement approach. And Stefferson and Associates was um, helping them with uh, community engagement and did a deep dive with um, community-based organizations to really flesh out the implications of fair enforcement and what that looked like and how that you know, affected different communities in different ways. And so we were able to summarize those results and provide them to the staff at Sound Transit, um, who then took those recommendations and um, ran them up the flagpole for consideration. And, you know, then Sound Transit decided to, to pilot a different way of um, enforcing their, um, their fares, their, you know, enforcing people paying. Um, and it, it actually changed <laughs> the, the clothes, actually, of the people doing the enforcement to be sort of less, um, law enforcement looking and a little bit more friendly. So that's that's one example that, that came to mind for that. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, thank you so much and thank you, Frana, for the presentation. Um, just overall looking at what was shared with us tonight, I mean, I think it is wise to, you know, find efficiencies and work together with the combining the pros and the comp plan and some of those outreach efforts. So I, I applaud that. I think that's very thoughtful. Um, now switching back to just specifically the pros plan, as you were presenting and I was looking at the timeline for outreach, it occurred to me that we as a community and individuals, families, we interact with our parks, recreation, and open spaces differently in different seasons. So I wonder if you uh, take into account or somehow like how you handle uh, your presentation and your questions to say, you know, like, now picture yourself on a 95 degree smoky day in August, uh, you know, to try to really ascertain, you know, what really are people's needs or take you there and, and understand, you know, what they're going to want. 
Any thoughts yeah. on how you might address that? Yeah, Colleen, did you wanna? Go ahead, Brent, I'll jump in after you. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I think you're, you're very correct on that. Um, although after the past few weeks, uh, people might be jumping for joy in the rain um, and be very excited to be in their parks um, as our rain and cool and clear skies um, come back. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think that in some ways that can affect it. It, would cer it will certainly affect our strategy and, and the timing. Um, we are going to have the online open house open longer, uh, accounting for the holidays um, at the end of the year. So it will be, we'll be launching it in November and then carrying it through into January. Um, and, you know, start looking at it a little bit early to be able to provide some early learnings to, to the staff and to the technical consultants. So, so that's one way that we will adapt to the timeline. Um, as far as how that affects our question, line, line of questioning, I think um, we won't be so much, I, I feel like the, the questions are going to be much more general that we're seeking. You know, a pros plan is sort of a more of a 30,000 foot level um, guiding document, you know, as a sort of a functional plan of the comp plan. So it doesn't really get down into the, the level of details of what do you want in this park, in this, in this space? So we won't really be asking those type of questions, although we are working um, to collaborate with the Parks Bond um, folks to make sure that, you know, whatever needs that they have, we can, we can try to address those, um, simultaneously, um, as well. So now right, that I just said that. Let me jump in here. <laughs> yeah. Because this is where, um, the, just this morning we did have a meeting with the, uh, former Methuen and Parametrics folks that are working on the Parks Bond projects, which are very much focused on what are we going to put in this park pretty soon. Um, and the, I think the main strategy we're hoping to use is to really provide some visuals for uh, folks to be able to look at and imagine in different parks. And, and we're working out a, a process by which they can kind of attach various ideas about certain uh, amenities or types of amenities that they would see being uh, a good fit for a certain park in the context of a broader look and feel for that park. So um, th that process is underway. Uh, and you know the, the seasonal question hadn't actually come up in that that specific away, but it's an it's an interesting thing for us to ponder as we look at putting that survey together. Yeah, thank you. If if the outreach is happening primarily in the in the middle of winter, um, people just might be in a different headspace about you know what their needs are and wants for our community. Um, so Good just w one other question, uh, and and that is because so I got to be it was one of the great joys of my experience as, on the parks board was participating in the last pros plan and all of the outreach. So with the tools and tactics that you're doing, uh, the community events, the intercepts, I, it, it was in, so incredibly valuable to be able to participate that in that as a parks board member. And so from this plan, and Colleen, I don't know if maybe this is a question for you, are we entirely outsourcing those touch points or will there still be an opportunity for our staff members and our parks board members uh, to engage directly with members of our community and get that feedback directly? Absolutely. Uh, so um, Stefferson Associates was at our last park board meeting. They'll be at our next park board meeting. And we're talking with the park board about being our ambassadors to the community that we're really looking to them to help amplify the outreach that we're doing because they do have connections. Um, and we have talked with Prana too about building in a timeline and some process for making sure we get staff input and opportunities for, for weighing in. So uh, very much aware of both of those. Okay. Yes, I encourage us to utilize the Parks Board as much as possible. Thank you so much. Councilmember Roberts. Uh, thank you. A couple <coughs> questions. First, I think um, what I think may be sort of more of a perpetual question is as we have more and more people living in apartments or others, no, types of um, housing units, how do you, is there any specific outreach or any specific methods that you have used to reach out to individuals who are not living in sort of what the traditional single family residence? Well, again, I will say that um, one of our identified communities is renters. And we've, uh, again, we've had some initial conversations about 
uh, connecting up with some of the property management companies that we have connections with through our MFTE program and through the recycling programs, and then potentially just some cold calling about trying to make sure that we're getting opportunities to uh, complete the survey out to all of our renters. Uh, we'll, we've got space reserved in the current, which I believe is now going to renters as well. Uh, so we are, again, we're, we're cognizant of that and we're open to input if others have ideas about effective ways to, to come at that particular issue. Okay. And then the other question is visuals are imp really great and really important and really help us visualize what could happen in a particular spot. At the other, t at the other end of the spectrum, visuals can be very limiting in sort of what people can expect or desire. You show an image and people get that image sort of becomes part of their conscious and <laughs> sort of thinking, oh, okay, that works. How do you balance that sort of providing images to sort of spark imagination, but also not limiting imagination for particular spaces? Well, again, I think the, um, the image conversation happened largely in the context of the park bond projects, which are actively under development. Um, and the conceptual designs for those parks are all already established. So it really is getting a, to a little bit finer level of detail about in the context of this existing conceptual design, which was already promised to the voters, here are some opportunities to think about the look and feel of each of these parks. And the idea, the categories that I saw were pictures that represented different types of materials, different types of activities. Is this an interactive activity or is it a passive activity? Um, what's so, the idea about spacing between amenities? So there are, there are images, but they're couched in the context of sort of concept. Um, so, so we might see a picture of, of a pickleball court and say, is this an amenity you might want to sort of give people the idea of what a pickleball court might look like? Similarly, when we look at the development code, you might see images of awnings and things like that. Of, this is what might be allowed. Yeah, so it might be even more general to be, uh, you know, an, 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 a sport court of some sort, and then, you know, drilling down to particular types of sport courts as we get farther into the process. So really starting at the higher level with kind of look and feel. Um, and I, I think to the extent, uh, to, to that extent, sport courts have kind of been if there's going to be one that's been identified in a conceptual design. So um, it was the things we were looking at were a little bit um, finer grain in terms of types of climbing equipment or types of playground equipment or natural materials versus metal versus color versus um, rolling hills, those kinds of things. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Other questions or comments? Customer Mork. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I really appreciate your question regarding renters. I was going to ask that. But the other question that's similar to that, you've spent a fair amount of time talking to us about different languages, which I think is very important. But you haven't really talked about how you're planning on reaching uh, different age groups or a disabled community. Could you elaborate a little bit more about that? Uh, yes, I'll start and then maybe Frana wants to add uh, detail from the actual doing the work perspective. So in the uh, sort of key audience uh, topic that she covered in an earlier slide, uh, youth, seniors, um, the disability community, um, the LGBT community, um, immigrants and refugees, low income, uh, people of color, um, these are all sort of uh, core audiences that we are trying to make some initial connections with some community leaders to get some thoughts and guidance about how to, uh, what are some strategies from their perspective that will help us reach deeper into those communities to make sure we're getting broader input from not just one community representative up from that community, but from a collection of people within that community. But, but really looking to the guidance of folks that are members of those various communities to help give us some advice about how to break into that, or, or what are the ways? Where do we need to be? Uh, you know, is it a is it better to be uh, digital, or is it better to be somewhere in person? Those kinds of things. But we have those those communities. Uh, Councilmember Mark are all on our list of kind of tier one um, uh, 
audiences that we are we are hoping to make initial connections with. And I'll, I'll follow up to add that our very first step in this engagement process is reaching out to have those constituent interviews. So really, that is the opportunity for, for us and for Shoreline staff to um, listen and learn and um, start to build a relationship with, with those individuals or um, start to build out the relationship and the, the touch points to have with people in, uh, that, in those different types of communities as well. And so those are really key to, to learning and then uh, unlocking the, the engagement process as we go. Thank you. Other questions or comments? I have one for starters. Thank, thank you for all of this. Um, this is something we've been talking about since I've been on council. I mean, this is something that's, that's very important to us, and we've recognized that you know there's 60,000 people in the city, and you know tonight's event, we know most of the folks who show up, and they're wonderful, amazing people, and I'm glad we have a consistent core. But I have always wanted to make sure that we're reaching the folks who don't always come into city hall for for events. Um, and Ms. Kelly, I thank you for bringing in someone with expertise in it, <clears throat> because I don't know a lot about it. My concern may be ill placed. <laughs> But my concern is that by trying to be inclusive, we not inadvertently become exclusive. And, and I'm sort of looking at the small group conversations part. And my concern is that we're identifying certain groups. We're not going to identify them all. Can't be done. And we're not going to reach every subgroup. And we're not, certainly not going to reach every individual. And my fear is that someone comes in and says, after this is done, one of two things. Either, hey, I found out through the grapevine that you were having a public meeting. I showed up, but it was for renters only, and I wasn't allowed to speak. I have a disability, and I wanted to be heard. So that's one concern. My other concern is that we're so particular with the invites that nobody knows this happens, and we then have an audience sitting here, and you're presenting the 47 different meetings you had, and someone's like, what are you talking about? I had no idea there were meetings. So I want to make sure that, that folks who do want to step up whether they are traditionally heard from or not, whether we've heard from 75 other people with their particular demographics, that everything is open to them and that we're very public about what we're doing. Is that possible while still meeting your goals of reaching out to groups that may not be comfortable in this kind of environment? It's absolutely fully intended. So everything that we're talking about in this targeted realm is really an add-on to what we always do and what we've always done. Um, we know that we have a, a contingent of people who want us to do more with pickleball and we expect to hear from them and we wanna be sure they hear about their opportunities to let us know what they want. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, this is, this is really, a, a, again, an add-on to our, our usual things. We will have broad public meetings. The survey will be available to anyone, which again is why you know, we welcome your ambassadorship too in terms of helping the community understand their ways to provide input. Um, and so, yes, uh, and, and we would never, if someone came to a meeting that wasn't for their group, we would never turn them away or, or disinvite them from sharing their perspective, even if it wasn't for their group. Um, that, would, that would not be a, a tactic that would make sense in the context of what we're trying to do. Um, but we also intend to have broad open access to input opportunities as well. Right. And, and how about the publicity side of it? The, again, that's the, the not intentionally secret, but you've set up a meeting where it's going to be conducted in Amharic, and that community knows about it, but nobody else does because that's not the meeting. I want to make sure that folks know that meeting is going on, and that if they want to show up to that one, they, they can choose to do that. Oh, that's a good point. I will say that we maybe hadn't considered that level of, of broad yeah. publicity, so uh, we can um, take that under advisement, Brenna, and think about our strategies as we uh, start actually uh, inviting people to groups, group meetings, how we can make sure that's on our website, on your website, you know, all the places that uh, our, our Facebook page, our typical outreach efforts. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Anything further? All right. Thank you very much for the presentation. And Ms. Milan, we're delighted to be working with you. All right. If Thank there's nothing further... Much. Thank you. Um, if there's nothing further, that is our final study item, and we are adjourned. Thank you.